Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our event. I am Marvin Rotran, the National Director of the League for Human Rights of B'nai B'rith Canada. This is the third in our series of our multicultural forums. And tonight's theme is Jewish Heritage Month with a little bit of a twist. Tonight, we're going to invent, in, in, introduce you to our guest, Gadir Kamal Murray. I'm going to leave it to her to tell you who she is, what she's done, and what her perspective is on Israel, anti-Semitism, on effectively the relations between countries like Canada, the United States, with, with the state of Israel. Her experiences are unique, and she has a perspective that is different than you may have heard in the past. But I'll leave that entirely up to her. Before going any farther, I want to offer condolences on behalf of B'nai B'rith to the victims of the tragic hate crime yesterday in Buffalo, New York. Uh, we're shocked, and the more we're learning about the alleged per perpetrator, the more frightened we become. It could easily have been any other minority group, including Jews. And as such, we're continuing our efforts to build a united front against you. Our call in January brought together over 40 political leaders and 200 community leaders to talk about how we can all work together. So tonight, we're talking about Jewish Heritage Month in a little bit of a different way. Bill S-232 was adopted by the Parliament of Canada in March of 2018. It declared every May as Jewish Heritage Month in Canada. It noted the contributions of Jews to the success and well-being of Canada and invited the population to take note and celebrate the Jewish Canadian identity. Unfortunately, the month is less celebrated than some of the other heritage months in Canada. Tonight, we've invited leaders of the Filipino community and the Tamil community to be with us because these communities have embraced their heritage months and set an example on what you can do to introduce all Canadians to the distinct identity of Filipino Canadians, the distinct identity of Tamil Canadians. As Jewish Canadians, we hope to be able to emulate that starting in 2022. And as such, B'nai B'rith this year began an effort to reach out to communities across Canada to alert them to Bill S-232. And in almost every circumstance, we found they'd never heard of it and nobody was celebrating uh, Jewish Heritage Month. I'm pleased to share with the audience tonight the fact that 43 cities have so far accepted the invitation of B'nai B'rith Canada to pass motions or proclamations recognizing May as Jewish Heritage Month in their community every year. I wanna thank in particular, Mayor Kennedy Stewart of Vancouver, who led the effort in his town, Mayor John Tory in Toronto, who did the same, City Councilor Sonny Moroz, uh, who's in the middle of a city council meeting in Montreal right now, and may be with us in a few moments, but only for a few moments in Montreal, Mayor Brian Bowman in Winnipeg, Mayor Sandra Masters in Regina, Mayor Lisa Helps in Victoria, and I don't want to uh, not note the contribution of other cities, cities as diverse as Vaughan, uh, Markham, Saskatoon, Cote St. Luke, Edmonton, Kitchener, Dollar des Ormo, Newmarket, Cape Breton Regional Municipality, Port Coquitlam, Burlington, and others are among the 43 and still growing number. And as well, we have had three school boards also uh, adopt Jewish Heritage Month. I should say four school boards, the English Montreal School Board, the York Region School Board, Halton District uh, uh, School Board, and the Toronto School Board. So tonight's speaker is Gadir Kamal Murray. Some of you may already know her. I'm sure all of you will learn a great deal tonight that will give you a fresh perspective on Israel and its place in the world. I followed Gadir's accomplishments with a sense of awe. Her career path as a Druze Israeli woman contradicts the narrative spread by many of the haters of Israel. Gadir's story is compelling. Uh, Erwin Kotler, Canada's special envoy for preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism will introduce her, telling us something of her time as a broadcaster and a member of the Knesset of Israel. And Gadir will tell us about her 
own career path, how she ended up in Washington, where she is today, the special envoy of the Jewish Agency for Israel to the Jewish Federation of uh, Greater Washington. The program tonight will be a few words from Michael Mostyn, our CEO at B'nai B'reds, followed by Anthony Housefather, Member of Parliament for Mount Royal, and also Chair of the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Working Group, followed by a brief message from Mayor John Tory of Toronto on Jewish Heritage Month, and greeting from Erwin Kotler. Uh, Erwin is right now halfway between Israel and Canada in the air. We didn't take a risk that his plane might be late, we had him record a message just in case he hadn't landed yet. He hasn't landed yet, so we're not going to see Erwin live tonight, but we are going to see his message uh, introducing Gadir. Finally, after that, Gadir will, will speak for as long as she wants, and there'll be a comment, a question period, and then a brief conclusion. I want to let everyone know that I'm hosting this event from my hotel room in beautiful North Bay, Ontario, where tomorrow Michael Mostyn and I have an event with the mayor of North Bay to, in essence, say this community did it right when it was confronted with anti-Semitism. But that you're going to have to watch on your television screens tomorrow night. So to kick off this event, I call on Michael Mostyn, the CEO of B'nai B'rith Canada, to give greetings. Well, thank you so much, Marvin. Uh, first of all, for the record, we are in separate hotel rooms, actually in separate hotels uh, in North Bay, but uh, very happy to be here uh, with Marvin and looking very much forward to uh, meeting with the mayor of North Bay, as Marvin mentioned tomorrow, as well as with um, members of the Jewish community uh, here in the month of May, which, of course, is also Jewish Heritage Month. Um, uh, first of all, just wanted to extend greetings on behalf of B'nai B'rith uh, to everyone joining us uh, today, both on Zoom uh, and on YouTube. Um, um, we're very uh, thankful to have all of you here today for what is sure to be an exceptional program with Gadir. And thank you, Gadir, for, uh, for joining with us. And I'm sure you're going to have um, a lot to say, a lot of uh, interesting points that um, not all of us know about Israel. We, we all talk about Israel being this vibrant democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East. Uh, but many, many people uh, think of it as uh, the Jewish state, which it is. But it is a diverse state um, uh, with diverse views. Um, and um, I think nobody better situated than yourself uh, to talk to to this diverse multicultural uh, Canadian crowd uh, here tonight about the diversity of Israel. We unfortunately did see a record amount of anti-Semitism take place uh, in Canada, as documented in the League for Human Rights of B'nai B'rith's annual audit, which we um, revealed um, uh, just a few weeks ago. Anti-Zionism is a specific manifestation of anti-Semitism um, that we see more and more of, unfortunately, here in Canada. Years ago, about a decade ago or more, we used to talk about this as a phenomenon on Canadian university campuses, where those who identified as Zionists, as lovers of the state of Israel, would often face um, uh, abuse on campus, um, um, most of the time verbal, but sometimes it even went into the physical. And B'nai B'rith was one of the organizations that warned that if we allow this to happen, if we allow this to take root, we will see it jump from the campuses off into mainstream Canadian society. Unfortunately, we did see that in the last month of May, May of last year, um, when during the Gaza-Israel uh, conflict, we saw protests across Canada, but we saw a disproportionate amount of violence targeting Jews, um, simply because they were viewed often by protesters, often at illegal protests, um, as individuals that because they were Jewish, they must uh, agree with opinions, their opinions reflect that of the state of Israel. And if you're making overgeneralizations about an individual and you're saying this is who this person is because of how they identify, and of course, most Jews in Canada identify as Zionists, the vast majority of us um, view ourselves as such. 
Um, nobody should be targeted because of who they are, what they think, what their religion might be, what they look like. And that's why it's so important, as Marvin mentioned, that we are growing out this multicultural forum so that we can bring together diverse communities, learn lessons from each other, but ensure that none of us are standing alone, that we will always be lending our voices to one another to stand up against hate. And once again, thank you everyone for being here with you tonight. And myself, along with everyone else, really look forward uh, to hearing from you, Gadir, uh, in your speech. Thank you, Michael. Before I go to the next, um, the next, um, Phase. I just want to announce some of the dignitaries who are with us already or will be with us in a few moments. Um, confirmed for this evening are Rodolfo Robles, the ambassador of the Philippines to Canada, a good friend of B'nai B'ith, and a star uh, in our last multicultural forum, uh, kicking off our rescue in the Philippines uh, event where uh, he spoke about President Kazan's opening the door to Jewish refugees from the Nazis in the late 1930s. In fact, I already have a question for you here for later about the Philippines and Israel. We'll get to that in a few minutes. I'd like to note also the former ambassador of the Philippines to Canada, Petronilla Garcia, ambassador retired, who is with us this evening. Uh, Erwin Kotler, our special envoy for preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism, is in the air between Tel Aviv and, Mon and Montreal, but has given us his message. Uh, Anthony Housefather, the MP for Mount Royal and the chair of the Canadian-Israel Interparliamentary Working Group is with us and will speak in a moment. Uh, Valerie Michalovic, the Parliamentary Affairs Secretary to Senator Judith Seidman, is here with us already or will be with us momentarily. I want to note the presence of city councillors from Montreal, Sonny Morose and Stephanie Valenzuela, who are with us for a few moments because they're in the middle of a city council meeting. Uh, I want to note the presence of City Councillor Anastasia Simakopoulos from the City of Dollar de Zormo, uh, City Councillor Rose Sicoli from the City of Brantford, uh, City Councillor Michael Van Hoyce from the City of London, School Commissioner Ellie Israel from the English Montreal School Board. I believe still already with us are Councillor Steve Gillespie and Lauren Green from Cape Breton Regional Municipality. And I want to note a few uh, community leaders who are great friends, B'nai B'rith, Bashir Hussein, the President of the Alliance of South Asian Communities, uh, and the founder of the Jewish Muslim Dialogue, uh, Philippine, Philomena Dabia from Filipino Seniors, Gemma Rayburn Burns from Playmass Caribbean Cultural Association, uh, Mr. Perry Belendra from the Tamil Association, Ms. Linda Mazzoni from the Federation of Filipino Canadian Associations, Ms. Julia Sguerra from Filga. And if I miss anyone, my apologies, but I want to say thank you all for being here this evening. And I will turn over the floor to Anthony Housefather, Member of Parliament. Uh, thank you so much, Marvin, and thank you so much, Michael, for inviting me to uh, say a few words. And Gadir, it is wonderful to make your acquaintance virtually. Um, and I'm so glad that you're representing Israel in the United States. Having strong representation from Israel in North America is absolutely key to confronting the anti-Zionist form of anti-Semitism that we see permeating uh, you know, North America, especially campuses today. So thank you for being there. And thank you for reminding everyone that while Israel is a Jewish state in the historical homeland of the Jewish people, it is also supposed to be a democratic state where everyone enjoys the same rights and freedoms. And sometimes it's imperfect. And sometimes we may not always agree with, with, with bills that Israel passes, such as the nation state law. But Overall, Israel is a home for everyone that lives there, regardless of religion, regardless of ethnicity, and we should be proud of that as supporters of Israel in North America. So as uh, first of all, um, as somebody who put forward Canadian Jewish Heritage Month, and um, I was a seconder to Michael Levin and Linda Frum, who were the sponsors of the bill. It was a bipartisan bill that went through Parliament in 2017. And I also had the pleasure of being a seconder on Filipino Heritage Month. Um, it is very exciting for me to be celebrating Jewish Heritage Month this month. Um, participating in the Great Beagle Challenge that MPs are participating in, where we identify our favorite bagel store in our riding um, and promote that. Um, but also to, uh, to acknowledge the many friends in the Filipino community and the fact we're celebrating Filipino Heritage Month in the month of June. Um, so great to see everybody. Um, and 
Marvin asked me to say a couple of words about what the Canada Israel Friendship Group that I chair is. So on both sides of the ocean, in Israel and in Canada, you have a bar part bipartisan group of legislators that forms a friendship group. In Israel, it's formed of members of all of the parties or most of the parties in the Knesset. In Canada, it's formed of all the parties in the House of Commons. Um, and we work together to sponsor each other um, back and forth in order to create economic ties, in order to create ties between parliamentarians so that we're always talking to each other about issues of concern. So that we're not only dealing with each other when there's a crisis, but developing ties between parliamentarians to be able to speak to each other very, very often and, and, and have that personal relationship. Because it's not only the executive, people often think that as Prime Minister Bennett and Prime Minister Trudeau and everything is between them, but parliament has a role and parliament has a role to play, whether it's adopting a, a motion condemning BDS, whether it's instructing the government on how to proceed. And we need to have those ties and we need parliamentarians to take their role in promoting the economic relationship with Israel, but also the social relationship and also, um, you know, being sure that we make clear to the government we want Israel to be defended at international fora like the United Nations. And so that's the kind of thing that we do. And we had a group of Israeli parliamentarians that came to visit us two weeks ago in Ottawa. We're likely to be going back there to the Knesset in the fall. Um, and when we go back and forth, we meet with ministers, we meet with, 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 with high level parliamentarians, um, but we also learn about what unites us. Um, and there's so much that unites Israel and Canada, whether it's common values, whether it's, it's a desire to do further economic ties, um, whether it's support of the international world order that is being undermined by Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, um, so many things. Um, and it's a pleasure to be part of bolstering that really important relationship, because as Michael mentioned before, Israel is the strongest democracy in the Middle East. Uh, Israel is certainly the country in the Middle East that Canada has the most ties to and the, and the greatest relationship and interconnection with. It's a strong ally. Um, and I look forward to furthering that relationship. And I look forward, forward to hearing all of the things Gadir has to say, although I have to go back and vote shortly. Um, but, you know, I'll, 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 uh, I'll try to listen for as much as I can. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Anthony. Much appreciate your time. We know you're in session and we know how hectic the life of a parliamentarian could be. Uh, Gadir might not know this. I was a city councillor for 39 years at Montreal. I used to do a lot of similar events where we would duck out of the hall, give a speech and run back in to vote on, on an item. Thank you, uh, Anthony. Uh, I'd like to recognize a few other people who are here who I uh, neglected the first time. Uh, thank you for coming, Aubrey Zeidenberg, who is the chair of the Nebris Special Advisory Committee. Uh, for those who are interested, the SAC will host Mayor John Tory on Thursday night. I urge everyone to take part in that. I'd like to recognize Joe Ortona, the chair of the English Montreal School Board. I thank you for coming, Joe. And from the Yukon, which is about as far as you can go in Canada and still be in the country, I want to welcome Rick Karp who's with the Jewish Cultural Society of the Yukon. Yes, there's a Jewish population in the Yukon as well. I want to note uh, Mark Roisberg, the president of the United Community of Russian-Speaking Jews. And I also want to welcome my good friend, Dario Boko, who is the Eastern Canada Regional Commander of the Knights of Rizal, an international non-sectarian, non-partisan organization that works for brotherhood and harmony between uh, between peoples. So I thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to ask our IT group to play the two videos. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to hear from Mayor John Tory of Toronto on Jewish Heritage Month. Then we're going to hear the introduction of Kadir Kamal Murray by Erwin Kotler, Canada's uh, special envoy for preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. Hello, Mayor John Tory here. In the month of May, we recognize Jewish Heritage Month, an opportunity to learn more about the rich Jewish history and its culture within our city. Jewish Canadians, Jewish Torontonians have enriched our lives and contributed greatly to the prosperity and to the heritage of our city with achievements across every field from business and science to sports, the arts, government and charitable endeavors. But beyond rightfully celebrating these contributions, May also calls out for action. This month, and year-round for that matter, we must stand in firm support of our Jewish community and especially in denouncing acts of hatred 
that fuel anti-Semitism. Now more than ever, we must firm up our resolve to do our part in creating a safer, more compassionate, and consciously inclusive Toronto for all, including our Jewish Torontonians. Diversity does indeed strengthen us. And as one of the most diverse cities in the world, we must continue to strive to be the most inclusive city in the world, where people from diverse faith and other backgrounds are not only accepted, but respected and embraced without exception. We must commit ourselves to learning more about our fellow Torontonians and counter misinformation that far too often leads to discrimination and to hatred and anti-Semitism. Jewish Canadians contribute to our city in many ways and have exhibited tremendous generosity for others. Throughout the pandemic, our Jewish community has come together to support their vulnerable neighbors and graciously donate to those in need. The better we understand one another, our faiths and our backgrounds, the better we can grow together and build a truly great city for all. And Jewish Heritage Month is an important part of that. Thank you. May I begin by commending B'nai B'rith Canada, its CEO, Michael Mostyn, its National Director of the League for Human Rights, Marvin Rotron, for convening uh, this timely and significant forum on multiculturalism, where I'm delighted to be able to share a few words and reflections about your uh, remarkable uh, guest this evening, Gadir Kamal Mrich, who is the Jewish Agency's senior emissary to the Washington Jewish Federation, but who represents a series of historic firsts. She is the first Jews to have served in that senior emissary capacity. And as someone who knows the uh, Washington Jewish leadership well, they have shared with me her remarkable contributions in that role. Second, she is the first Jews woman to have anchored the Saturday night weekly news program in Hebrew. And as someone who watches uh, the Israeli news from Canada, we have a link to the channel. I've been one of the beneficiaries of her clarity of content and communication. She is the first Jews woman to have been elected to the Israeli Knesset. And here, another personal reflection, because my daughter, Michal <coughs> Kotler Wunsch, served with her uh, in the Knesset. And indeed, they were both uh, colleagues in the same party, Kahol Avan, the Blue and White Party. She is the first Jews woman to have shared the caucuses on gender equality and women's rights and to have spearheaded important reforms in that regard. She has been recognized as a global, young global leader by the World Economic Forum and has been awarded a distinguished award by the Movement for Quality Government, another NGO that I know well, reflecting yet again uh, her commitment and involvement and contributions at the community and NGO level. In a word, at this point, I can best sum up Gadir's contributions by saying that she represents and reflects a looking glass of the bond between Jews, Arabs, and Jews. She represents the hope for peaceful relations within Israel and uh, with Israel's neighbors. And as a mother of two, <clears throat> Mary the Shadi, but someone who, apart from everything else that I've mentioned regarding her professional contributions, is a lover of art, of nature, of cooking, of peace, a lover of people. And she represents, for all of us, the hope for the future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce a person I admire, 
a person who has done great things and a person who I think is going to do even greater things. We may not always agree with her, but I think she will always have compelling arguments to put forward. I invite Kadir Kamal Murray to address us and take as long as you want. There's no time limit. Thank you very much, uh, Marvin. Thank you all for having me and for the willingness uh, to understand us better as uh, Israel, as minorities. Uh, can I ask uh, Jill, can you just uh, mute because we uh, mute yourself because we can hear you? Uh, Jill Valent, if you can, please just to mute yourself. Um, I'm happy to be tonight with you. I always introduce myself by saying, hello, my name is Ghadir. I am an Israeli, but not a Jew. I am an Arab, but not a Muslim. I am a minority within a minority. My mother tongue is Arabic. My religion is Druze, and I am proud Israeli. Good luck with that. I symbolize the complexity. I symbolize the beauty. I symbolize uh, real Israel. I am a, a minority as a Druze among the uh, Arabs in, in, in Israel. The Arab are the majority, and we are the minority as Druze. But the Arab in Israel are a minority within the majority of the Jewish people. The Jewish people in Israel are the minority in the Middle East, which is full of Arabs in nearby, in nearby countries. So the, this is very complex uh, neighborhood called Middle East. And Israel itself is a very complex uh, society and very complex uh, state. And I'm glad, uh, glad and proud to represent and to highlight the beauty and the complexity and to work uh, with every social agent, with every leader, with every involved citizen, uh, having the willingness and to have the, the ability and the knowledge to understand the world better and to connect us all and to create the bridges and to think how each one of us from his, from his field can uh, contribute to the... Um, constructive discussions about who we are as people, who we are as citizens of the world. Uh, I am uh, well known in Israel by uh, people describe me in Israel the first Druze. I was, uh, I will tell you at first who we are, the Druze people. Uh, we are a minority. Uh, there are in the world 1.5 Druze people. We live in the Middle East, in Israel, in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. In Israel, there are 105 uh, um, 50,000 Druze people located in 16 uh, Druze villages. And the relationship between the Druze and the Jews in Israel is very strong. It's, uh, it's called the covenant of blood in which we fighting together, we are building together the state, we are protecting together the state. The relationship between us as Druze and the Jews is very strong uh, ties and bonds and very deep and started even before the establishment of the state relying on the fact that as a minority, we have no any territorial aspirations. We have no any national aspirations. We are loyal to the country that we were born in, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and, and in Israel. So in Israel, people, people call me the, the first Druze, the first Druze to be an anchor woman. I broadcasted news in Israel in Arabic, and then they wanted me also in Hebrew. And some days I uh, pro broadcasted news in Arabic and in Hebrew, both languages, same day. I opened the news uh, at 7 p.m. by saying Masa'ul Khair min Urshalim al-Quds in Arabic. And an hour after that, at 8 p.m. by, by opening in Hebrew, I reftov l'chamir ushalayim. So... As, I, as, as the complexity of my identity to broadcast uh, national news in uh, two languages, in Arabic and in Hebrew, it was amazing for me and it symbolized the amazing rich mosaic that we have uh, in Israel. So I was the first one to broadcast news in media and then the first uh, Druze female in the Israeli Knesset, in the Israeli parliament. I was elected, broke records and uh, served all Israelis. I didn't... Uh, uh, narrow my work in a narrow prism of uh, as a representative of the Druze, I will work just for the Druze. I worked also for the minorities in general and for the Israelis, 9 million people in general. We served all of them because you need also to give the national uh, aspect, the national services. And uh, today I am the first, they call the non-Jewish, I call Arab or Druze, senior envoy of the Jewish Agency for Israel. When I decided to take time out from politics, I am sure you followed. We had the crazy days in the Israeli political arena. We had four elections, no budget, no 
a real functioning government. We succeeded last year to form a new government to stabilize the system, but you know, it seems like it's very unstable yet. I decided to took time out. I uh, had an offer to join Jaffe, the Jewish Agency for Israel, and to come here to DC as a senior envoy to talk about exactly who we are, our story, our authentic, real story as a woman, as a periphery, as a minority, as the real Israel. So we built a position in which we work with federations in, in North America and with Hillel International, universities, campuses, which is very, very challenging arena uh, those days. So this is a position in which I am located physically in DC, but we give a national coverage in North America working with organizations, with men, women, with the lay leaders, with the students in order to shape and reshape public opinion about who we are. And uh, when we say who we are, it's amazing to see that sometimes people less understand the uniqueness of Israel. Uh, Israel today, although the domestic issues, the many domestic issues and challenges that we have, by the way, like any other country, uh, um, Anthony, you talked about imperfection. Yeah, in, imperfection is one of the characteristics when we talk about managing uh, countries or leading countries. There is no country in the world, not in the modern era and not in the past. Uh, as Israel, we are very sophisticated. We are very complicated. We have our own challenges, but get, guess what? We still a vibrant democracy. Look what happened last year. We succeeded to form a new government. We succeed. We had a smooth transition of power after two years, after four elections, after no budget, in a tool, democratic, in a democratic tool, in an election, democratic election, real election. We had no troops on ground. We saw what happened here uh, on the 6th of January in the superpower of the world, in the democracy of the world. We had no military in the streets, although we had uh, demonstrations, although we had divided, polarized society, we succeeded to form a government. When, when we had the government, Benjamin Netanyahu stood up, went to the seat of the opposition leader, and, and Bennett, Naftali Bennett, came and sat on the seat of the prime minister. Smooth transition of power, which is something that mustn't be taken for granted. We are also strong. Uh, financially, we are strong. Our GDP is 14 times that of Egypt. It's six times that of uh, Lebanon. It's eight times that of Iran. It is double than Saudi Arabia. We, Israel, spend 5% of our GDP on research, more than any other country. Our military is strong. Although the, th the threats, we still control the sky, we still control uh, the sea. And when we talk about uh, the, the region, Dramatic changes, new Middle East, new opportunities, normalization, new ties, especially with the pragmatic Sunni countries, the Gulf states, and of course, a uh, new political arena in a way of when people ask me which government you have, I say in Hebrew, Chagiga, celebration, in a way of who could imagine Bennett from the right sitting with Abbas from the left, Arab Jews, all colors, right, left, it's amazing to see that although the complexity, this government is succeeding to, to prove to ourselves at first that yes, we can. Yes, we can find the mutual path. I don't know how much it will last. Maybe tomorrow morning we will see that it will be dissolved, but at least we are trying. So we have a strong democracy. We have strong uh, military. We have strong uh, financial uh, in all levels. And we have no Middle East and we have strong political arena. So this is the uniqueness of Israel that I rely when I am talking about. One of the most important tools that I found when I dealt and worked in media as a journalist, as an anchor woman, when I worked in public uh, diplomacy, when I worked in politics, is education. Education, 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 education as a key, education as a tool. I am sure each one of you dealing with that, working with that. When we are talking about anti-Semitism, I am sure you saw we had, uh, I cannot even describe it, the videos that we had in one of the demonstrations in Canada two months ago, people were chanting, go back to 48. I can guarantee you nobody is understanding what does it mean 48, or nobody want to understand what does it mean yeah. going back to 48. Going back to 48, it means we are not in the level of discussing the negotiation or the core issues, 
uh, refugees, borders, or Jerusalem, going back to 48, it means no existence at all of Israel. So when I talk about education, it is amazing to see how much people less understand this complexity. I arrived here, I relocated with my family. The, in the end of June, uh, July, we came here last uh, year, and one day we were hiking in the Great Falls here in the Maryland part uh, nearby. And I have two children, my youngest, Liam, seven years old. And I called him in Arabic, Liam, shwayi shwayi. Shwayi shwayi in Arabic, it means slowly, step by step. A man who was nearby, he heard me. So he told me, ah, hi, shwayi shwayi, Arabic, Morocco. I said, no, Israel. He said, what? Don't you say Palestine? I said, no, Israel. We are Israelis. We live in Israel. He said, what? People speak Arabic in Israel? I said, yes. 21% of the population, more than 2 million Israelis are Arabs, speak Arabic. He said, what? I looked at my husband and I smiled. I told him, do you know what? That is why we need to be here. To, to explain sometimes basic details, sometimes the, the, the must, the details that we think or, or we assume that everybody knows, it is amazing to see how much people don't know, but on the other hand, they are thirsty to know. One woman, after I finished a lecture, after, before I started the lecture, uh, came to me and told me, and she was a woman who studied in Columbia University in New York. When she saw me entering that hall, she came and was so happy. She told me, ah, you are a Druze Israeli woman. One day when we visited Israel, we were in a Jeep tour and we saw in tents where Druze people live. And I couldn't, I didn't know even how to react. I don't live in tents. In a way of when we talk about education, it is a process and it should be in many aspects, in many levels to teach who is living in Israel. Israel is, is a Jewish state, but it is also a democracy. We work to strengthen the Jewish identity, the connection to the state, but we also work to strengthen the Israeli identity, to educate who is living in Israel. Sometimes if even people mistakenly see or say the non-Jewish sector in Israel, we have a name, Arabs living in Israel. Among this sector, we have Bedouins, we have Christians, we have Muslims, we have Druze. It is important always to educate and to understand who is living there. When we are talking about education and when we are talking about uh, how to combat or how, how to answer those claims or, or all the BDS movement or anti-Israel sentiment or anti-Semitism in general, when we are talking about education, it is important to understand that we need to educate sometimes for, for understanding in a way of when I care about something, I must know about it. I must read, I must explore, I must visit, I must talk to people, I must absorb the atmosphere. Sometimes I ask people, who is the agriculture minister in Israel? In a way of when we care about something, and by the way, in general, it is right about any issue, any topic, before I develop a stand about something or an opinion about something, I must study it. I must understand the topic. I must dive and go in high resolution to understand the whole issue in order to think what I think about this issue. So it is amazing to see how much superficial agendas are so deep. Sometimes people have no time or, or no willingness to dive and to understand this complexity. Today we are in the superficial levels with titles, apartheid, victims, right, bad, black, no guys, Israel and in general, any country. And when we are talking and I studied international relations, I specialized in negotiations and making decisions in the international field, managing country is so complicated. And we, when we seek as leaders or uninvolved citizens to understand and to be, to be involved in this capacity, in this work, we must understand what is happening. Who is happening? Who is doing? And what? What? Why he is doing that? Sometimes with students, we open maps. We open maps because today it became so trendy to criticize Israel. Sometimes even without knowing what Israel exists on the map, this is what I see in campuses. So we open maps. We go back to last century. What happened? Why the state of Israel was established? What happened in the negotiation process during the years? The wars. What, was, what we was willing to give in order to have peace, what our partners or our friends gave. 
it means it's very complicated. It's very important to understand this uh, complexity. Another important tool and uh, researchers found that you will take home with you just 17% of what I said now. So please take just this sentence. It is less than 17%. Don't talk about them. Talk with them. Talk to them, not as a cliche, as a real way of living, as a real way of connecting to people, as a real way of working with people. When you seek or when you want to understand what, what, what is happening now with Israelis, talk to Israelis. Ask them what they feel, what they need, what they worry about, what they believe we should do. When you seek to know about minorities in general in Israel, about Circassians, about Druze, about Muslims in Israel, go directly and meet them. Uh, in Israel, I live in Daliat el Carmel. Daliat el Carmel is the largest uh, Druze village in Israel, located in Carmel Mountain, near the city of Haifa. We have amazing, beautiful, traditional market. On Shabbat, Saturday, many people come to visit our market to eat our delicious food. And I always encourage people, don't stop just in the market. Go beyond. Take a good local guide. Go, for example, to Beit Yad Labanim, where our national anthem, Hatigva, was written in 8084 by Naftali Hertz Amber. When I say that, the, few people understand that or even know that, that our national anthem, the symbol of the state of Israel, was written in a Druze village, in my village, in the Carmel Mountain. So I always encourage people, take a good local guide, go there. Today it is Beit Yad Labanim, where we commemorate our Druze soldiers, 439 Druze soldiers who fell protecting the country. Learn, see the history, learn about how much our past is intertwined. Learn how much it is important to keep going, to work together as, and to play major role together, to shape our daily life, to shape our country. So to talk to people directly, sometimes people don't do it. Um, another important thing, Israelis is not what you think. Arabs in Israel is not what you think. I am amazed sometimes to see that me, people even at first, they don't know that Arab lives in, live in Israel. And they think sometimes about Israel, like about Arabs, like a primitive tribe, uh, tribe living in tents. In Israel, we have vibrant democracy. We have rich mosaic full of people who are coming from different places, different cultures, different languages who share a lot. And we are working so hard to strengthen our social resilience, to think about what we share, what unites us. There are amazing initiatives in the field, amazing peoples, amazing mutual projects to highlight this beauty in Israel. I don't know if you remember, in Israel, we had, on the uh, 30th of April last year, we had Har Miron crowd crush. 45 Jewish worshippers were killed that day. Their brothers, Arabs, from Tamra, from cities, from nearby villages, came to help their Jewish brothers. Three years, three years ago, we had floodings in Naharia, in the north of Israel. Many Jewish people lost their stores, their restaurants. Arabs came to help. And like those initiatives, we have dozens from the Jewish sector helping the Arab sector, closing the gaps, building the trust. This is real Israel that we have. This is the beautiful Israel that we have and we must highlight and we're working ha so hard to highlight. On the other hand, we are very strong. Israel, as Israelis, as a state, as a society, we are robust enough we are strong enough, we are brave enough, we are honest enough, and we are able enough to talk about Israel, words and all. We say we do mistakes, we say we did mistakes, we say that we are not perfect. We, and by the way, the ability of Israel to learn from its own mistakes, it's incredible. I always say I am not coming to provide the Kim Jong-un advocacy to tell you love us, we are perfect, we are pink, we are gold. No, you will not have it in Israel. When I lecture, when I talk to students or to organizations, there is no special guards uh, watching, recording, checking what I am talking. We have free liberal discussions about who we are. We think and rethink, we shape and we reshape. We have the ability to, to develop constructive dialogues, what we should do. 
how Zionism as a concept, as a religion, as a culture should be in the 21st century, how Israel as a democratic state and as a Jewish state should be in the 21st century. We are very strong to have this ability to discuss with ourselves and make and fix our mistakes and admit if we do mistakes and looking for partners and seeking for peace. This is very unique to Israel. One day, a friend of mine from a nearby country called me a couple of years ago. He told me, Ghadir, are you crazy? You are the Israelis? You sent physically your prime minister to court to ask him how much the cigars, how, how much the cigars that he got as a gift from his friend? I told him, listen to me, my dear friend. This is the strength of Israel. We check ourselves. We have no corrupted regimes. The fact that we had president in jail, the fact that we had a prime minister in jail, it proves to us, to us all that nobody is above the law. We check ourselves. Because democracy, at, at the end of the day, is not just the rule of the, of the people. It is the rule of the law. Unlike many corrupted regimes, unlike dictatorships that we have, no, Israel is very strong very strong democracy, very strong society, and we have the ability, although the complexity, to be a Jewish state and to be a democracy, to promote rights of all minorities, of all people living there. Although there is no absolute equality, yes, we are working hard. We see even the budgets. For example, last budgets, they doubled the budget for Arab sector. Instead of 15 billion, now it is 30 billion. We see, we work hard. Sometimes it, come in a it comes in a delay of a couple of years, but we are working so hard to strengthen our social resilience. Social activism, another tool. My father told me when I was a child, if you have something to say, say it. If you believe something should be changed, go and change it. Even as a child, I remember almost on every Shabbat, on every Saturday, we hosted a Jewish family in our home. My father was a contractor, and in my village, many people visited the traditional uh, market in our village. I didn't imagine, or I didn't think, or understood then how much it shaped my personality as a child. Sitting with Israelis, speaking about social issues, about politics, how much it shaped my personality in a way that we were raised that you are not a minority in the, in the Jewish state, you are an integral part, and you must be involved. Even as a child, I was in uh, delegations, in student, in student council, in all the social involvement. My mother remembered me, instead of playing as a child, I was sitting in front of a mirror and broadcasting news and talking to people and interview people. When I was in the age of uh, 12, in the sixth grade, I called the manager of a local TV station and I told him, hi, my name is Ghadir and I want to host my own TV program. And he laughed because he told me, you're a child. Let's start by volunteering. And this is what I did. And then I had my own TV program in my village. And instead of writing homework, I started to film homework. I am telling you that because I truly believe in people. I truly believe in our role and I was educated in a way that you cannot care just to your family or your friends. Go beyond to larger circles, how I can build my neighborhood. How can I change things in my village slash city? How I can change the state and how I can change the globe as a citizen of the globe. And this is not a cliche, this is a way of living. And uh, I now realize that every position that I chose was position in which I have huge influence because I talk to people, I shape and reshape public opinion about who we are, what I think or what I believe uh, we should do. Because at the end of the day, each one of us is a unique identity. Each one of us is a social agent. And it is so important to share our stories to the world. Look at me, a Druze Israeli woman living in, C in D.C. sent by the Jewish Agency of Israel to talk about beauty and to talk about complexity and to connect people and organizations in North America and Israel. And I am sure that each one of you has his own unique, authentic story to share with the world. So please do that. I truly believe in our role. I truly believe that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where, who you are. It doesn't matter where do you live. At the end of the day, you have your role. You have your role to change any, in any topic. 
you believe that you can change. This is what I do and I am proud to be part of this circle. Even now with, with Zoom, it's not in person meeting, but at the end of the day, we have now 64 people. We are talking to each other. We are learning from each other. And I don't know how we can cooperate. Maybe one day we can have this win-win connection in which we can educate and learn through each other, from each other, and promote amazing ideas, amazing mutual programs uh, together. I want to thank you for uh, listening and I want to hear you. I truly believe that part of my work is to listen to you, to listen and to talk to you, not just to bring my input. I can talk for hours and uh, about uh, media, about political issues, about social issues, but I uh, choose to stop now and to listen to you. We have time for Q&A, for questions. So be free to ask anything that you believe or would like to ask me. Thank you, Gadir. Before I open it up for a, a couple of comments or a couple of questions, I do want to say I could never address an audience in my third language with as much passion and intelligence no. as you just did. I've already had a couple of texts and messages. People are saying how impressed your ability just to articulate your deeply held views that uh, you know are so meaningful to so many other people um, on this call. I also want to mention a number of other people who have joined the call who um, were a bit late but need to be recognized, and that is Councillor Morris Vesley of Dollar de Zormo. Uh, Morris is also a member of the National Board of B'nai B'rith Canada. Councillor Ryan Brownstein, uh, School Trustee Amy Collard from Halton uh, Regional, District Regional School Board. Uh, Sharon Nelson from the Jamaica Association, Suda Halder representing Suhel Mia, the Bangladesh Sociocultural Forum. Uh, I also want to note that I did get a message from Norman Simon. He was supposed to be on the Zoom call. He's watching you on YouTube, and the people on YouTube won't be able to ask a, a question, but he wanted you to know that he found you extremely dynamic. He is the chair of Canadians for Coexistence, and they do the same work that you do with people of different faiths to bring together dialogue and understanding. I also want to recognize Romeo Remigio of the Filipino Association of Montreal and Suburbs, who's with us also this night, this evening, along with Dante Tabamo, who uh, is uh, the uh, uh, vice president uh, ex of the uh, organization. Uh, the first question is reserved for a friend of B'nai B'rith who had a death in the family and could not be here. I want to note the friendship of Ramon Vicente, who has been at all our events over the past year, the chair of the Filipino Family Services, and he wanted to address two very short questions to you, uh, here. one of which is he wanted to know whether Israelis are aware of the special relationship between the Philippines and Israel, particularly President Kazan's open door policy that led to the admission of 1,300 Jews fleeing the Nazis when other countries closed their door. Uh, Ramon was one of our speakers along with Ambassador Ramon, uh, 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 Ambassador Rodrigo Robles for our event Rescue in the Philippines in April. And he wants to know in essence whether uh, uh, Israelis are aware that the Philippines voted for the the creation of the State of Israel in the United Nations vote of 1947, and that the special relationship has uh, continued since then. Thank you, for the, thank you for the question. If the question, if, if Israelis are aware of that, I would say yes. Is it enough? I would say no. And I will explain why not enough, because Israel is very, as we said, very, very complicated state. I worked in media, I covered news, uh, you should come and see the news section, how we work in media in Israel. In the coverage of 24-7, you have news in Israel 24-7. I'm sure you, you are following what is happening in recent days, recent uh, two months in Israel, the terror wave in Israel. In Israel, you cannot rest. Always there are news, always there are domestic issues. Uh, the, the militaristic or the... the, the um, not the social problem, or, or now we have also the political crisis again. Maybe we are going to fifth election. I don't know. If, you know, I, I quit after the fourth. I thought that we finished without. Now we have the fifth election and then maybe the sixth election because by, by polls, 
there is no any uh, neither one of the blocks can can form a new government in Israel so we have very complex uh, complexity in the political arena in recent years in Israel unstable political arena uh, the terror wave recent months and in general everything related to terror and every everything related to security or militarism is very strong in Israel usually people talk about those two issues. We are a garrison state in a way of security, military or militarism or so or security issues controlling the agendas in the news all days during weekend and during weekdays. So yes, people are aware of that. People especially uh, working with the, with the public uh, diplomatic issues, uh, political issues, they know the huge, the important contribution to the Philippines and to Philippine, to the people and to the leaders in general. But I, I'm afraid that the people less are less aware of that. Uh, maybe you need to put more pressure to concentrate more work uh, to develop and to promote uh, working with media and both public diplomacy to highlight those issues. But in Israel, it is very hard to promote uh, external or international issues that are, that are not related directly to security or terror. It's controlling the agenda in media 24-7. I hear you. Ramon's second question was also repeated to me by a couple of other people who could not be here this evening. They're aware of the Abraham Accords, which many people see as wildly successful, having gone beyond any hope. Uh, the agreements with Bahrain, uh, with the United Arab Emirates in particular, have led to an explosion of trade and tourism and in sectorial agreements. Uh, Ramon's question is, um, is there a possibility of extending this to other neighboring states in the Middle East and North Africa? Um, and is any work actually going on in that regard right now? Uh, last Thursday, I hosted the event, the official event of the Israeli embassy in, uh, in the U.S. here in D.C. in three <laughs> languages. I opened by greeting the Arab speakers, the many um, ambassadors and officials and diplo diplomats, Arab diplomats, who came to celebrate with us this year in the Day of Independence of Yom Ma'ut. And believe me, it's wow. It's wow to see the amount. It's wow to see how much uh, people are thirsty, how much people understood that this is a win-win situation to normalize. Abraham Accords, I, I, I'm afraid that sometimes uh, strangers less understand the ramifications, the huge benefits that we have under Abraham Accords. Uh, my ministers, my friends in, this, in the different parties are flying, forcing back from Israel to nearby, uh, to nearby countries just to sign more and more agreements, uh, free trade, tourists in all levels, in all uh, uh, sectors, in all fields, agriculture, high tech, uh, things that, you know, in, in amounts of money that you cannot imagine even. So the new Middle East is, is, is a real game changer. Uh, step two, now the talk is about Saudi Arabia, to bring Saudi Arabia to join Abraham Accord, to, to call it Abraham Accord 2, uh, Abraham Accords 2. Uh, some of the work still uh, under the table, some is in the declarative level uh, already maybe with the help of uh, or under the umbrella of the, U of the U.S. to try to find a creative, mutual way to cooperate and to normalize. Although Saudi Arabia is a little bit uh, more complicated because of the structure of the society, because of many uh, uniqueness in, the, in Saudi Arabia, if we talk about uh, the religious component in that, uh, in that uh, uh, region, but in general, all countries are looking to what is happening in Abraham Accords. UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, look, look what happened last uh, one and a half, even no, last month. The Negev summit in Israel, we had six foreign ministers, four of them from Arab countries, from Bahrain, from UAE, from Morocco, and from Egypt, in the Negev, in the heart of Israel, talking about new opportunities. 
uh, and creating new opportunities. There is a huge project now in the Red Sea between Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Israel and Jordan. It means we understand that the financial base can be a base for normalization, that this is a win-win situation that we all are committed to have. And I believe that after Saudi Arabia, we can see the domino effect for more countries. But the complexity here is huge. We need to solve it slowly, slowly, because each country has its uniqueness. And uh, it's not a deal, as uh, you know, Trump called it as a deal, as a businessman. We need to understand the complexity, the religious uh, nuances, the social nuances, and to solve it each state after state. Thank you, Gadir. Before I throw open for general comments and uh, questions, I want to recognize a few more people. Uh, Maria Galau from the Filipino Canadian House in Toronto. Um, Zaneda uh, Ferry uh, Karubi from uh, the Chancellor of Gilmore College, and Ramon Posada, Region 2 Commander of Knights of Rizal. I'm uh, now going to throw it open for uh, questions and comments. You can either text me or use the chat function. And I see I have a question already from Ellie Israel, uh, School Commissioner in uh, the English Montreal School Board. Uh, Ellie, it's yours. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my camera doesn't work. But uh, first of all, Kol HaKavod, um, I see it says Marvin Rotrand. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yes. Okay, good. Kol HaKavod, you're a brilliant orator and your enthusiasm and your passion uh, not only comes through in the way you speak, but let me just say, you're beautiful, you're hot. Um, but my question to you is, with so much diversity and so much multiculturalism and so many languages from people who come from all over the world, um, how are you so successful in educating youth and adolescents and adults um, how is it that you're so successful with so many languages when we in Canada have two and we're, uh, we're working very hard to um, keep everybody united? Wow, it's an important question. Thank you. Uh, I truly, at first, I truly believe in my work. I truly believe in what I do. I truly believe that this is important for us all, not just as women, not just as minorities, not just as Israelis, but as a human being, as citizens of the world. The new liberal world is talking about universalism. To ask what is universal, what is what can unite us, not the discussion in which we talk about uh, our religions and our uh, tribes and our languages, no. There are differences between us. But at the end of the day, there are mutual goals and there are mutual ways of thinking and uh, building our new world. And again, not as a cliche, I succeeded. I am coming from a patriarchal society. I, um, I saw how I succeeded to change perceptions. At the end of the day, perceptions is something that it's the hardest thing to change. Some of the photos, when I show the slides, I show that the first official meeting with me and the leader of my party was in the spiritual leader of the Druze community in his home, in a room full of men. I ended the campaign with rooms full of women. When I called women, when I tweeted, posted, was interviewed, asking women to join me in a way that I saw. Dario, can you mute yourself? Thank you. In a way that we can succeed, it proved, it proved to me that yes, we can. Yes, we can if we talk to society in the in the proper way if we know how to talk to people when to talk to people which terminology to use when we are talking to people as not just as leaders as as social agents we can change people's mind we can change how people may think or we can change beliefs because at, at the end of the day sometimes we are dealing with rooted thoughts and beliefs that people you know it's built in and it's very hard to change it it's very hard to reshape it but I saw that I succeeded. I succeeded among women. I su succeeded among minorities. 
and I succeeded among Israelis when I talk about equality, when I talk about gender equality and equality in general in Israel. So relying on that, believing on that, although the world is now, in some of the countries we see that people prefer nationalism rather than democratic beliefs, at the end of the day, if we see in macro perspectives, the, the liberal, the modern, the real democracies in the world is talking about universalism, about real equality, about seeing the people as equal citizens. This is what I believe in. And this is what I do through my work in the, in the, in the uh, public uh, diplomacy, in media, in politics. I see you as a human being and I see there are always options. There are always options to cooperate. We just need to choose. After diagnosa, we, the diagnosis, we need now to move for options. There are always actions. We just need to choose. What do you care about? What I care about? What do you have? What I don't have? And let us work together. And I saw and I succeeded to do it by media, by, by uh, journalism, and by politics. And I believe in that. I believe in that so much. Thank you, Gadir. The next question is to Rich Robertson. Mr. Robertson? Yeah, I'm here, Marvin. Thank you so much for your very enlightening uh, discussion, Gadir. I think that you provide a very unique perspective as a, as a Druze uh, member of the Israeli population. So my question for you is maybe you could uh, let us know how has the, the Druze and their special relationship with Israel been received by uh, Muslim Arabs? And as well, what role do you perceive the Druze playing as intermediaries between Jews and Muslims in the struggle for peace in, in the Middle East? And in uh, thank you, Rich. Um, the Druze history, the Druze narrative is different than uh, Arabs in general in Israel, Christians and Muslims. During the establishment of the state or even before the establishment of the state, the Druze leaders realized that there is a similarity in the values, in the religion, with the Jewish people. That is why we decided to build the state of Israel with the Jewish people as citizens, even before the establishment of the state. The narrative of Palestinians or the narrative of Arabs in general is different. People talk about Nakba, about being uprooted from their homes during the establishment of the state. So there are differences. The Druze people in Israel are sometimes caught in the middle in a way that we, some Jewish people see as, as Arabs, some Arabs see as, as betrayers. You are so pro-Israeli, you draft, you draft into army in the highest percentage, 82%. It is the highest number in Israel among the Druze sector. It is higher even than the number among the Jewish sector, which is around 74%. So we cut in the middle. I speak Arabic, but the, the component in my identity, the Arab component is in my identity, less exists. I even realized in DC how much I am Israeli. When I make friends, I look for Israelis. I go to Israeli store. I eat Israeli food. I listen to Israeli music. In a way of, I see this complexity, but we are very pro-Israeli. We see it even how we vote in the... In the 85% of Druze people vote for center right. Just 15% voted last, last elections to left or Arab uh, parties. Uh, although my mother tongue is Arabic, but I think in Hebrew. I dream in Hebrew. When I, when I have an interview, I prepare myself if this is in Arabic. If this is in Hebrew, I just speak. So it's, it's amazing to see how much we are integrated in Israeli society. You know, you, you study with Jewish people, you learn with Israelis, you work with Israelis, you, you think, you speak Israelis even, not Hebrew, but Israelis in the nuances. Uh, so this is the relationship, very strong bonds. But in recent years, and I wrote about it and published articles about it, that we need to replace terminology. We shouldn't speak uh, anymore about covenant of blood. We need to speak about covenant of life. We are not coming to fight with you. We don't need anybody, anybody to pay us off for drafting into army. This is our duty as citizens. We need to have equality as, social, as, as equal citizens in Israel. So the integration is so important. We have it. And I believe that Israel can be proud of. This is a success story of an integration of a minority in a, democr in a, in a democratic or in a, or in a democracy. The, the story of the Druze people in Israel. 
Thank you, Gadir. Uh, again, a passionate and moving, moving answer. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the people in the audience don't know much about the Druze people, but I think they really need to know a lot more. And I think we're going to do a lot more to talk about this relationship as well. Uh, the next uh, question will go to Commissioner Joe Ortona. Uh, Joe, it's yours. Thank you very much, and uh, and and thank you for for your uh, your presentation this evening. It was very informative uh, for me, and much appreciated. Um, of course, each country is is unique and different, but uh, sometimes I'm noticing you know very many uh, similarities from one country to another in terms of in terms of their uh, their struggles um, and and some of the political conflicts that arise. Um, we at the English Montreal School Board adopted a resolution recently, you know, uh, recognizing uh, May as uh, the Jewish uh, Heritage Month. And we obviously teach uh, and, and have for quite some time um, about, you know, the, the history, uh, the Holocaust and, and, and things like that. Um, and, and I'm just wondering, uh, I'd, I'd like your perspective on, on what can we do uh, more in terms of educating our children um, about the the history. Um, um, obviously, history comes with s some good, and obviously, with regards to uh, World War II, some very very bad uh, atrocities. And how can we use that in order to foster more harmonious relationships among different groups of peoples uh, of different religions, um, and and how we can accomplish that. Uh, here. I'd, I'd be very interested to have your perspective on that. Well, at first, I really appreciate your work, and this is something that mustn't be taken for granted, the, the ability, the willingness the, to dedicate time to teach students in those ages. It's so important. I will tell you about myself. Uh, as a journalist, as a politician, I always was interested to read, to know what is happening here in North America, and especially with uh, Jewish communities, uh, the ability to have to speak three languages, to consume uh, uh, media or newspaper in Hebrew in Israel and regionally in Arabic and globally in English, it, 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 uh, it helps a lot. But it doesn't matter how much I read. At the end of the day, it's... Uh, much more powerful to live here. When I speak to people in the store or in restaurant and ask them what they feel, what when I talk to them, even sometimes small talk about uh, political issues, about social issues, it is a non-conventional weapon. You can understand much more when you have this direct touch in person firsthand when you absorb the atmosphere. So I really encourage you when we talk about education as a process, to go to step two, to the next level of, for example, to, to travel there, to travel to Israel, to meet the people, to absorb the atmosphere, to have exchange of delegations between students, between leaders, or we have many uh, stories, many important and interesting public figures that we can bring you to share their stories, their identities, to talk about, you know, uh, what we share, what we have, First hand, not by Zoom and not uh, by, uh, you know, by reading, because at the end of the day, when you read an article, it's like a 2D. I would like to have 3D. I would like to go to Israel. And I always encourage people, don't stop in Jerusalem. Israel is beyond Hakotel. Israel is uh, not Tel Aviv. Israel is a periphery. Minorities, uh, go, go there, eat the food, talk to the people absorb them, understand, listen to them. It's very powerful and, and do it in bilateral, not just go there, bring people from Israel to your school. Uh, we always, we believe in educate the educators. At the end of the day, the educators too need to pass a process of education to understand better, you know, to do this more understanding of real Israel. So I really encourage you to do that. It's all, always about the uh, budgets and abilities and logistics, but I believe it's much more powerful to do. This is something that will stay uh, and will uh, stay in their memories. Thank you very thank much. You. Our, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Rotona. Our next question goes to Will Barkley. Mr. Barkley? Can you hear me just fine? Uh, yes, uh, can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so I just want to start by saying uh, thank you, and I agree with you 100%. It's super important to really talk to people and to kind of leave them with questions instead of kind of forcing answers down their throats. 
but my question is that in my experience, there seems to be kind of a disjunct between the Palestinians who are located in Palestine, their supporters here in North America and around the world, and the Palestinians themselves are very much kind of anti PLO, Fatah, Hamas, these terrorist organizations. But their supporters here have really romanticized the conflict to a great degree, and so they support the, the, the horrid organizations. How do you think we resolve this disjunct and get everyone uh, on the same page, so to speak, and fighting the real enemy? First of all, unfortunately, we cannot have all of us or all of the people on the same page. We need to choose our battles. At the end of the day, our time is limited, our energy is limited, and time is the most expensive resource in the modern era. So I need to choose my battles. Some sectors, I even don't go and don't try. Some people are fed by fundamentalistic, radical beliefs that it doesn't matter how much I try with, with, with the knowledge, with the numbers, with the facts, with the real reality, with the, with the stories. It doesn't matter how hard I work. I will not try to convince them that we have the right to exist even. So you need to choose your battles. In some sectors, just leave it. Don't waste your time. I choose to work with people who are sometimes confused, who sometimes less understand what is happening in Israel, have the ability or the willingness to really understand how we can work together. There I work. And when I, when I, when I say they, it means with students, with people, with interfaith groups, with committees, with federations, with organizations. This is very diverse and huge audiences that we can influence. So just leave that sector who, are, who is very fanatic, very fundamentalistic, and, and concentrate your work here. And when you concentrate, concentrate your work here, you need to work in two levels. First level is storytelling. At the end of the day, our history is built on stories. Our identities, our memories, our mindset, our, we, we learn, we study, we work, we connect, we communicate through stories, through identities. So to tell the story of you as well, who you are, where, you are, where do you live, what do you believe in? And also the next, the next level is knowledge, to provide the facts. Sometimes we go back to 37, 1937, Peel. Israel said yes, Palestinians said no. 47, 1947, the, part, the UN partition law, the UN partition plan, do you remember that? The, the, uh, the plan was to divide the country. What Israel said, yes, Palestinian, what they said, no, go back to the, continue to the whole negotiation process. Even, even till 2000, Barak, Ehud Barak was willing to return the whole Gaza Strip, 96% of the West Bank, compensation of $30 billion to Palestinians. What Arafat said, no, to continue, Kundalisa rise, or, it means... So, we have the storytelling, but we have also the knowledge, the data, the info. And in modern era, the person who is owning the, the data is, is, is the part, is the one who is going to win. So tell your story and be provided with a huge amount of data. Do you want to challenge me? Go for it. I want to challenge you. Are you talking about Israel is bad, Israel is wrong? Listen to me. We did mistakes. We are not perfect. But we know, and we know that as long as the conflict is continue to happen, is is wrong for all parts. But it's not just our fault. Uh, you know, Mahmoud Abbas, as Palestinian leader, is sitting there, is let's say corrupted. He's he is not the democratic leader. He is not enjoying the trust of the Palestinians. So it's very complicated. Do you want to talk about it? This is what I talk to people. Please challenge me. Let me tell your story and let me share with you my knowledge. So share the, your knowledge and share your story and choose your battles. Thank you, Gadir. Last two questions. We'll go with Monsieur Pierre uh, Beauregard, followed by Councillor Morris Vesley, and then I'm going to have la mode de la fin, the conclusion. Mr. Beauregard. Uh, Mrs. Maria, it's a pleasure to listen to you. You're very uh, well-spoken. And uh, as someone mentioned, Maybe you might be an aspiring prime minister, but that's not my question. <laughs> one day, one day, not one yet. <laughs> day. Uh, I've been following, I've been an activist for peace uh, for 19, since 1978. I've been looking at the Middle East. It seems like in a way it's as if and nothing has changed in a way. Uh, but uh, the Abraham Accords, I have to say, has uh, brought more enthusiasm and hope for me. And I was happy to hear you talk about it. And I've been following uh, some webinars of which uh, Erhu Barak, you just mentioned, has participated in, as well as uh, former speaker Hilik Barr and uh, former Prime Minister of Canada, 
uh, Stephen Harper. And uh, we've seen many, many uh, countries participating. It's very enthusiastic, very exciting. But we keep wondering, how can we bring in Palestine, Palestinians in this? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? It's very important uh, question because now we have a lot of readings uh, and studies recently showing that we mustn't neglect the Palestinian issue. We mustn't neglect or treat the Palestinian conflict as our backyard. Uh, the fact that we succeeded to normalize relationship with many Arab countries in the region, it is amazing. It is important to all parts, but it doesn't mean that we can and we can allow ourselves to neglect the Palestinian conflict. Uh, it's complicated, but maybe there will be a pressure when we talk about the uh, Abraham Accords uh, step two and bringing Saudi Arabia to the table. Maybe there will be some um, understandings uh, toward the Palestinian conflict. But it is important to understand uh, um, Palestinian domestic uh, politics, recent uh, politics, and to understand how much they suffer from domestic problematic challenges within Palestinian leaders. So on the one hand, we have a, a, a government in Israel, which is amazing, you know, representing all colors, all religions, all uh, Arabs and Jews and left and right. But, but this government, the structure of, of this government is so complicated in a way of even without trying to, to touch the hot potatoes, even without knowing anything without trying to do anything they have no already they have no majority it's 60 60. it means the atmosphere in israel it's like counting down for the next election and the next election as i said as i mentioned in three polls we see that no one of the blocks will have the ability to form a new government it's 56 57 59 58 it's very complicated israelis are going to the right and I cannot see any any chance in, in, in the in their short future of real, deep, honest, direct negotiation, unfortunately. Uh, Palestinian Palestinians are very complicated too. Maybe with under the umbrella the umbrella of external forces of uh, other players of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, with some of the understanding, we will succeed to do something. But I totally agree with you. We mustn't neglect it. We mustn't treat it as it was our uh, backyard because uh, there are a lot of warnings that it maybe it will there will 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 see explosion in the next future in that uh, in that place. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, uh, last question will go to Morris Vesley. Uh, Morris, you're muted. Please unmute. Sorry, sorry. Um, you speak wonderfully. Um, I'm very impressed with um, your knowledge of, of uh, subjects and the way you're speaking to us, the enthusiasm. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing to see. Thank you. Um, I have my son-in-law is uh, Israeli, just became a Canadian citizen. And um, he has explained it to me. But I would like I'd like to hear from you as a member of the Knesset. Uh, Israel abstained in the recent vote in sanctioning um, Russia on um, what is happening in the Ukraine. And um, I would love for you to just take a moment, uh, uh, you know, I'm a politician as well, <laughs> to just take a moment and just maybe talk to us a little bit about that whole uh, yep. situation. It, it must be very odd to people around the world to see Israel abstain. It's been explained to me, but I think it's something that I would love to hear from you as a member of the Knesset. Uh, sorry, uh, thank I'm going to clarify before Gadir answers that Gadir is a what? former member of the Knesset. She's not in the current Knesset, uh, Morris. Oh. She did not run in the recent election. But the Sorry, question, I came in, I came in late, so okay, okay not no a problem. problem. But not a but problem. Your the knowledge and, and your understanding of um, issues in Israel is yes. remarkable, and I would really love to hear uh, your comments. Yes, thank you. So, um, 
We cut uh, in the middle as Israel. On the one hand, we understand that as a democracy and as a Jewish state and as a uh, as a humanitarian uh, and uh, moral country, as and as Jewish people who experienced what they experienced just last uh, half of, the, of a century, we must be there to help our brothers and our sisters in Ukraine. And I will tell you something, we do that. Most of the work is under the table. Many things, many important things should be not in the declarative level. Uh, some of you are politicians and you understand in that. Sometimes we work without talking about what we do. This is what we do in Israel. Huge, huge support, huge help going to Ukraine, to Ukrainian people. Uh, and sometimes the world don't, don't know that, um, which is important to do it. And this is our commitment and this is our duty to any human being uh, who, who passed this crisis. On the other hand, we are very, we must be very careful. It's very, very sensitive issues because uh, the real leader in Syria, our, our backyard is not uh, Bashar al-Assad, is Putin. And um, a month ago, I was at Harvard University in a seminar with the young leaders and uh, I participated for 10 days there. At the end, Mike Herzog, our ambassador was there in a panel and one of the students uh, just uh, stood up and asked him why it is so important for Israel to keep, to maintain the security measures that sometimes restrict uh, Palestinians. And during her questions, we started receiving the push from the, our smartphones about the terror attack that we had in Tel Aviv, in the heart of Israel. And we said this is the reason. Sometimes people don't understand what is happening in Israel. Security measures. So Syria is very... In Syria, as you know, we have uh, multiple player, players, uh, sometimes uh, totally different interests. Now Iranian is going there with the Russians, with Syrians, with many players there. So we must treat it in a very, very sensitive way. We already saw what Putin can do, what is he capable for, and we must be very careful because at the end of the day, there is just one Jewish state in the world, one Israel, which is very tiny, very sensitive, not surrounded by real, deep, trusted friends. So we do, believe me, we do what we can do, sometimes without talking about it, but we also, we are very clever, clever. And I believe that the government now is succeeding to handle this crisis in a clever way, but never say never. I, I cannot predict how this war will uh, continue, how it will be developed. But meanwhile, I believe Israel can maintain its interests and help in a clever way, in a creative ways, I would say, uh, the people in Ukraine. Thank you, Vivir. Uh, before I close off this evening, a couple of remarks. First of all, urge the audience to take note of the chat from Perry Belendra about uh, May 18th, Malik Kaval, the Tamil Genocide Day, and the uh, growing relationship the Tamil communities had with the Jewish community in Canada and the dialogue that uh, the communities have engaged in this la last year. Second of all, some of the themes you've just raised in the last two questions uh, have come up in Parliament, actually. There was a speech by Senator Leo Hosakis on the 2nd of March, uh, and it's something that B'nai B'rith hears a lot as well, that one of the frustrations people have is they don't see a legitimate Palestinian voice as a partner for peace. Uh, people are saying between the corrupt Palestinian Authority and the terrorist group Hamas, there is no one who actually speaks for the Palestinians, and they need to be able to elect legitimate voices. The current situation doesn't allow for that to happen. And it's one of the impediments that while we're seeing progress with neighboring states, uh, the ability to dialogue with an honest partner just doesn't seem to exist. As well, anyone who does speak up seems to be putting themselves in jeopardy. Recently, newspapers in Canada carried uh, stories about Rami Aman, a, a blogger, a Zoom, uh, someone who host meetings on Zoom in Gaza, uh, who was arrested for opening up dialogue with Israelis, not government to government, but people to people to find common ground. He ended up being arrested and shut down. So people are saying this is very frustrating. It's the same theme that you have. 
And the solution is not necessarily to convince those you can never convince, but to work with those that you can convince and at least build a relationship with. This concludes our evening. I want to thank our special guest, uh, Gadir Kamal Murray. Uh, I'm, I said I was in awe of you. I really am. I worked in a second language for most of my time at City Hall. I was never quite as articulate as you, even in a third language. Uh, you, you say you were doing this as work. You're not doing it as work. This is the core of who you are. You are telling us that you're proud of your heritage. You're proud of your citizenship. You're proud of the image your country is giving to the world as a whole. And you know it can do great things as a nation and as a partner for others. We too share the same values. You will have noted that tonight our audience comes from the four corners of Canada and have many people of different, of different ethnicities and races. And that is because we have been building slowly and surely a dialogue called United Against Hate. We have things in common and we will support each other. As B'nai B'rith, fights anti-Semitism, we also fight anti-Asian racism, we work with the black community, other minorities, and they work with us. And when it comes to supporting Israel, we're strong voices because our community is proud of what Israel has done as a nation state. And our friends are as well. And we work with them to foster knowledge in the Jewish community of what their communities have achieved here in Canada and back at home. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank all of you having been with us this evening. This concludes our multicultural forum. Gadir, you'll hear from me in the next couple of days. Uh, Thank you. Erwin will be mortified when he finds out that his <laughs> introduction wasn't aired, but these things happen. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll get this by email in the next day or two. Thank you very much. Thank, you, thank you for having me. Gadir, thank you all. Good. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Have a very, very nice evening. Bye Good bye. night. Thank you all. Bye-bye.